I want to give a shout out to Ann and all the staff at the Hallenstein Center who've done such a good job preparing for this. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of work to put on a two-day conference, and they've been great. John Lauk, who's uh, a lot of the brains behind this conference, uh, this conference has done a great job as well. Well, as Ann said, a uh, hearty welcome to all of you. We're just delighted that you're here with us this morning. Uh, a good West Michigan Welcome to those from all over the Midwest and those who will be viewing this conference. This conference began as a, a very ambitious conversation in Annette Kirk's uh, library in Macosta, Michigan, up in the stump country, about an hour and a half north of here, about a year ago. John Lauk was there on that occasion, and John and Annette and I spoke about the possibilities of a Midwestern studies renaissance. And what I didn't realize at the time, because I'm in a different field of history, is that the renaissance of the Midwest was already underway. And I thought this would be a great opportunity for the Hauenstein Center to host something that would really be significant in the region's historiography. So I'm hoping that we can be really bold uh, over the next two days and to really bring the Midwest back into the center of the American imagination. That's one of my ambitions for the conference. Well, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, West Michigan here. You're in a very special place. I think the place you are right now certainly symbolizes and, in fact, shows a renaissance that is taking place. Uh, West Michigan is a remarkable place. Lonely Planet said that we were the number one travel destination, one of the number one travel destinations in the world that should be explored because of the beautiful Lake Michigan beaches and all the things that uh, people can do here. And those of you who've already walked the city have told me how su delightfully surprised you are by what you have found here and how lively it is. Uh, Forbes calls Grand, Grand Rapids the best city for raising a family. Movoto says we are one of America's top 10 most exciting mid-sized cities in the United States. Forbes ranks us highly in a number of categories. I'll just mention a couple of them says we're one of the best cities in the nation where a person can make their mark. We rank high in surveys that show our workforce is happy and can have a fulfilling career right here in, in Grand Rapids. And oh, I shouldn't forget to say, we are the number two best foodie city for your wallet and number one beer town in America. So welcome to West Michigan, a remarkable place. You know, I look at this whole region, just one substantive comment before we move on. I look at this region between the crest of the Appalachians and the crest of the Rockies, and I don't see one pinpoint on a map that is a field of dreams. I see a huge area that is a field of dreams. Now, why would I say that? Because we are tied, this region of the country is actually tied to the vision of the founders of our country. When you're flying over the Midwest, you see it most ostensibly in the rectangular grid of the streets uh, and the, the highways and the rural roads. And you see the township and range system order. That's, that's right from Jefferson's vision of what the new republic would look like as it expanded west and to have a, a, an orderly land ordinance survey so that people could fill these vast spaces in an orderly way and not in a haphazard manner. So you have Thomas Jefferson's vision actually etched into the landscape. But you also have Madison's vision. Madison, recall, at the Constitutional Convention of 1787, proposed something very bold that had never been acted on in human history. Madison said, a republic can be large. It can keep enlarging. But how do you do that? You do that by encouraging all the factions that will arise from geographically different areas and people with different interests. And so when the first generations of people came over the crest of the Appalachians and they saw this vast area out in front of them, they were actually taking with them a dream of what kind of republic we would be, a new republic to be sure, and one where the whole area would become really a field of dreams. This is where the ambitions of America started. This is where the founders dream of an enlarged republic. Okay, they've got their independence from Britain, and now what do we do with it? What happens once people actually begin to settle these vast areas? We are that field of dreams. That's the Midwest. 
And as a historian, that's what really uh, excites me about Midwestern studies and the renaissance of Midwestern culture. When you look at the ordnance societies that were transplanted from the East Coast over the crest of the Appalachians and into this vast field of dreams, you see Americans establishing a new civilization. It's a very exciting story. We don't have to be second place to anybody in this country. Our field of dreams is where it started. So I am so happy that you're here. I'm happy that you're part of this, this scholarly renaissance. And we're going to explore this field of dreams over the next two days in a very compelling way. It's now my honor to introduce my colleague, Joe Hogan, who's a program manager for our Common Ground Initiative here at the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies. And Joe will be introducing our first keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gleaves. It's been suggested that for this first introduction, all I really need to say is, now I invite to the podium John Lauk. If you don't know him, you should. And indeed, I think I could get away with it. If not in other ways, you know John Lauk as the man whose intellectual vision, charm, and expansive network have in so many ways made this conference possible. John is a special kind of scholar, one who can articulate a bold vision for his field and who can advocate for it, not just in the academy, but in the wide world. His work as president of the Midwestern History Association is testament to that. Not even taking into, his, into account his other job as an attorney and senior advisor and counsel to South Dakota Senator jo John Thune, Lauk's work in history alone constitutes a great career. He's authored four books on Midwestern political and economic history, one of which, The Lost Region Toward a Revival of Midwestern History, helped inspire this conference. So please join me in welcoming someone you really should know, John Lauk. Thank you, Joe, for that very generous introduction. I really appreciate it. Joe has been a uh, miracle worker behind the scenes, pulling everything together for this conference, and uh, he's done a great job. I'm sure many of you have worked with him, and uh, for our folks who are um, participating in the conference today and contributing chapters to uh, a future volume about this whole topic, Joe is the guy you need to give your chapters to, and he will be on your case very soon, if he hasn't been already, about getting your chapters in. Uh, thanks also to Gleaves Whitney, uh, the man who runs the Howenstein Center and brings in all these amazing speakers and uh, is um, a true testament to the idea of civic leadership. Uh, Gleaves, I called him last week and we were chatting about this upcoming conference and he said, uh, just a minute, I'm wrapping up with Cornell West, uh, and I need to get in our next speaker the next day. He has an amazing flow of speakers through the Howenstein Center. And I also think we need to recognize here this morning Ralph Howenstein, who made all this possible, a Midwesterner who was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, made his way to Grand Rapids to uh, ultimately make his fortune and to make all of this possible. So uh, hopefully we'll be talking more about Ralph in uh, the next few days. Well, this morning I just wanted to kick things off with a little discussion about uh, why we have problems uh, as people who are interested in Midwestern history and why Midwestern history and Midwestern studies lags behind where it should and just give you a sense of uh, why I think the Midwest is a unique space and why it deserves its own uh, focus in the academy. Um, I don't think it'll come as a shock to anybody here that we have uh, a problem getting much attention to our region. Uh, it's all sort of summed up, I think, nicely in this old uh, Onion article about how this expedition was sent out to the center of the United States and they found this mysterious region known as the Midwest. This, by the way, was a uh, was a spoof done when the Onion was in Madison, Wisconsin, 
and unfortunately the onion has moved to the coasts and I think it does less of this Midwestern flyover country humor. Uh, but this was, uh, this summed up things nicely, I thought. The New Yorker had a map a few years ago about how do New Yorkers see the country? And um, this is, uh, I'm not gonna read all the detailed print, fine print here, but you get the idea. Same thing applies to California. There's uh, sort of a myopic vision there. Um, you may know, if you're a Mad Men fan, that Don Draper is this sort of mysterious figure from somewhere in the Midwest, maybe a farm in Indiana. It sort of gets lost in the bigger uh, arc of the show. But he is, uh, according, to the, um, according to the subtext of the show, this sort of amorphous, mysterious person from the middle of the country, uh, which is interesting in and of itself. But one thing I wanted to draw out of the show that has uh, been highlighted in the last couple of seasons is how Don and his wife, Megan, uh, became bi-coastal. He was working in Manhattan, and she was working in uh, Hollywood, in uh, in the film industry, and they would fly back and forth, and all of a sudden in the show, they began talking about what it means to be bi-coastal, and it sort of highlights how our culture is sort of concentrated on the coasts, and the cultural centers, which dominate the country, tend to be located on the coasts. And uh, the Wall Street Journal did sort of a fun story about this, where they dug into the history of this term bi-coastal, and it began to be used in the 1950s, just a little bit, slowly grew, and became most prominent in the 1970s. This is the exact period of time in which Midwestern studies and Midwestern history basically collapsed. Uh, some of you may know this Carly Karen, who writes this blog about traveling and about how uh, she's sort of obsessed with uh, two parts of the country. Uh, LA and Manhattan, and uh, if you read the blog, you really get a good sense of how the Midwest or flyover country can kind of drop out of the national cultural conversation. Uh, New York Times had a story uh, a couple months ago about where the people who are famous in the United States come from. And uh, if you look at the dark blue, you can see where the people that rise to the top and become prominent in the culture are from New York. and. Uh, and California, not shockingly, because they're sort of close to the levers of cultural power. But alas, uh, poor North Dakota is down at the bottom of the list. Very few people become famous from North Dakota. I guess Peggy Lee was the last big one. Um, but South Dakota is not far behind in Indiana and places like that. <clears throat> Most famously, Saul Steinberg had this cover uh, in the New Yorker in the 1970s. And this is the view of the world, or view of the United States, as seen from Manhattan. So you can see all the details of every little uh, street corner in Manhattan. But beyond the Hudson River, it's just sort of an amorphous blob. Somewhere out there is Nebraska, maybe. There's somewhere known as Canada, but it's all sort of vague. Well, on the scholarly front, uh, we know we have problems with popular culture. On the scholarly front, uh, things aren't... Uh, that rosy either. It used to be in the scholarly world, and in, in history in particular, we had a number of journals that focused on the history of the Midwest. We had Mississippi Valley Historical Review out in Lincoln, we had Mid-America in Chicago, Midwest Review in Wayne, uh, Nebraska, Old Northwest in Miami, Ohio, Western Illinois in Macomb, uh, Eastern or Upper Midwest History in Duluth. But unfortunately, um, within the last 25 years or so, all of those journals have died. So we've lost a lot of the outlets for uh, Midwestern history. Um, in terms of presses that focus on the Midwest and publish books about the Midwest and uh, other institutions that focus on Midwestern history, we've also seen a lot of carnage in the last 20 or 30 years. Indiana University Press had that great series on uh, the Midwest, but it's basically petered out. I talked to the director of the press at the OAH last week, and he said, uh, yes, we haven't officially sent out a press release announcing its death, but it's, uh, it is dead. 
some of these presses did not even, uh, the entire presses shut down. Iowa State University Press, University of South Dakota Press, both shut down. University of Missouri Press was announced to be closed, uh, and they have officially closed it, but there was such a furor that uh, a couple months later, the chancellor of the system reopened it. Um, Ohio State University Press doesn't even publish historical works anymore. Um, one of my favorite stories, back when there was more of a focus on promoting studies of the Midwest, is how at the Newberry Library in Chicago, uh, they received a grant from the Ford Foundation uh, to fund fellowships for people to study the Midwest. These were fellowships in Midwestern studies, uh, and they went on for about five years in the late 40s and early 50s, but uh, they died off too. Um, and the unfortunate demise of the Rural Studies Program at Southwest Minnesota State, or Southwest Minnesota. Um, so here's a good example of the uh, problems uh, we face uh, in terms of other regions. Uh, University of Georgia has a lot of historians who focus on the history of the South in Georgia, 10, I think. Uh, University of Minnesota, bigger institution, bigger history department. Um, they have zero people who teach the history of the Midwest. And I think it's safe to say, uh, I was talking to someone during coffee here this morning, and I, uh, I was told that Ohio State University, which has, I think, 70 history professors, has no one who teaches the history of the Midwest. So I could go down the list. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, a pretty small group of people who teach the history of the Midwest. Well, in the beginning, uh, when uh, some Midwestern historians got together in the early 20th century to begin focusing on their region, they started a journal that focused uh, on the interior of the country. Um, and in the early years, 83% of the articles in uh, their journal focused on the Midwest, but it had declined to 10% by 1964. And uh, by the 1960s, the journal lost its regional orientation, became a national journal, became the Journal of American History, unfortunately. Um, there's, um, there was an uh, article a few years ago I'd like to call your attention to by Carl Ubelod about the complete demise of all these uh, structures for studying the Midwest, all these outlets for studying the Midwest. Ubelod was... Uh, from Wisconsin, he must clearly be one of these Germans from Wisconsin with a name like that. Uh, but he was focused on studying the Midwest, but he uh, he's moved on or he's passed away. I remember when I was living in Iowa City in the 1990s, I was very excited because this young man in Chicago who was very entrepreneurial began a magazine called The Midwesterner. And the purpose of the magazine was to be the New Yorker but for the Midwest and headquartered in Chicago. Great idea, it was beautifully done. It, uh, I was very excited about writing for it and about the time I finished a piece for the magazine, it went under after four issues. Um, he just couldn't pull it off, he couldn't get the advertisers together and the donors together. Um, I wish I could actually put a picture of one of the copies of the Midwesterner on my PowerPoint, but I couldn't find one on the Googles because uh, it sort of happened pre-internet. So there is not one to, one to dig up. But the demise of the Midwesterner, I think, tells us uh, a lot about uh, the, our state of affairs. Well, I try to explain all of this and name the problem and describe the dimensions of this problem in my recent book, uh, The Lost Region. If you want to hear, if you want to read uh, all the details of what I've been talking about. All right, so we have a problem, uh, but uh, I think we're all interested in solving this problem and reviving interest in this region, and so we need to begin talking about, um, you know, what is the region we want to study? Uh, what is the Midwest? This often comes up in these discussions, um, you know, when I do radio interviews, et cetera, to talk about this, uh, this whole question. One of the first questions people ask is, well, what do you think the Midwest is? When I, uh, Garrison Keeler was in Sioux Falls a couple of years ago, um, and I was describing this whole uh, project to him, and his first question was, well, is Ohio in the Midwest? 
Is Cleveland in the Midwest? What about the Western Reserve? Is that really Midwestern? I mean, he was really focused on the question of Ohio. But I, I think that's a good entry point for a lot of people is uh, d discussing what, what we mean when we say Midwest. Well, I'm very conventional, and I follow the traditional 12-state definition that was set forth in the census in the early 19th century. Um, followed, and this was a uh, definition followed by Frederick Jackson Turner and people like James, the geographer James Shortridge in his famous book about the Midwest. Now, I am completely aware that some of these uh, places in the Midwest, you know, there's a, there's a dividing point. Um, my, um, my mentor, John Miller, is here today from South Dakota. We were on a panel last weekend at the Center for Western Studies entitled, Where Does the Midwest End and the Great Plains Begin? Well, it, it uh, is somewhere in here. So these uh, states are divided, as is Missouri, sort of southern Missouri is more southern than Midwestern. But this kind of complexity makes it hard for some social scientists to get their mind around the Midwest as a region. And I think it does sort of inhibit studies of the region. But I think we can do some interesting things with this. Here's a, here's a study um, or survey that was done by a Boston architectural firm when they were uh, showing off some new plans. They had a showing, and they asked everyone who came to the showing to take the mouse of their computer and draw a circle around what they considered to be the Midwest. And they took all of these circles, and they combined them together, and they uh, came up with this perception survey of what the average person thinks the Midwest is. And this is not bad, I don't think. I mean, this is pretty close. I don't know why some people are choosing Mexico and stuff. That seems a little odd. <laughs> but for the most part, this is pretty spot on. What's interesting here is if you break this down a little bit between people who actually lived in the Midwest and people who are uh, from outside the Midwest. So if you're pretty much a Midwesterner, you, you, you nail these 12 states in terms of what the region is, uh, almost spot on. If you have people that aren't Midwesterners, they're sort of outside the region and they're not as familiar, you know, the boundaries get a little more fuzzy. Oklahoma creeps, creeps in there, a little bit of Kentucky and stuff, which probably, you know, obviously aren't Midwest. But I think this is an interesting uh, exercise. Uh, probably many of you know Nate Silver, who runs 538. This is the polling firm that does all the analysis of the presidential races, et cetera. Uh, one of his polls, uh, uh, in a sizable poll, almost 3,000 people, he asked people, what do you consider part of the Midwest? And again, this is very, very close uh, to, to being accurate. Uh, the most obvious states that are Midwestern uh, are Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana, which makes, again, makes a lot of sense. Now, he doesn't break this down uh, by, let's say, county or whatever in the states, but I bet if you could break down the data a little bit, you would see in, for example, South Dakota, very few people out here, West River, South Dakota, would have said they are uh, Midwestern, but almost all these people would have said so. That's what makes the state pink. If you could divide the state a little bit, I bet this would be all red and this would be more white, sort of Wyoming-ish. Anyway, I think uh, this, is, this is helpful. Uh, a cartography society took 100 maps of what people think the Midwest is and they laid them, layered them all together and they came up with this image. Again, pretty, uh, pretty strong consensus, I would say. Here's an old study that I, re that I ran across that I really like. And again, if you're looking for projects for graduate students and things that are creative to determine what is the Midwest, this is the kind of thing you want to do. This was a survey. This was done in the 1960s. This is a survey where uh, graduate students would mail out uh, a short survey to postmasters. And they would ask a postmaster, please answer this one simple question. Do you consider yourself in the Midwest? And they would tally all this data and figure out where the postmasters, again, a pretty good source, a person with local knowledge and some bearings about where they are in space. And you can see uh, how, how many of them uh, consider themselves Midwestern. Again, useful. 
useful. Uh, well, I was going to pull up this. Is it possible to pull up a, a website? OK, perfect. Uh, if you're a professor and you're looking for a, for a good exercise to begin a class on Midwestern history, um, this, is, this is one thing you can do. This is a guy who works for the Huffington Post, and he asked a bunch of his coworkers, what do you consider the Midwest? And he, uh, he tallied all their results. Uh, again, I mean, these were mostly people on the coasts, um, but you get some... You get some pretty interesting answers. This, this person from Indiana does a very nice job. <laughs> Chloe is from Britain. I don't know. She puts Nevada in there. This is not bad. Again, this guy is pretty good. Um, there's one in here that I really like. Some of these are spot on. This is the one I like. <laughs> that sort of cap captures the, the problem nicely. Uh, but anyway, as a result of the survey, uh, again, Iowa considered heart of the Midwest, not shocking. Uh, most people put places like Iowa, Nebraska, and the Dakotas in the Midwest. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the very interesting backstory about uh, the Midwest and how it came to be. Um, which is something that came up on NPR this week. I was talking with Jeremy Hobson on his show Here and Now, and he was, uh, the whole issue came up, and I can't remember which part ended up on air and which part uh, got cut, but he asked me about this idea that the Midwest is, is this sort of amorphous uh, blob of white people in the center of the country. And I was quick to point out to him that uh, the United St or the uh, Midwest has a very interesting, varied, multi-ethnic, multinational past, and I tried to talk about how the Midwest emerged out of these uh, empires, uh, France and Britain and uh, Native American empires, and how this story can be very compelling if you're teaching a class on the Midwest, and if you can tie it into global studies and uh, foreign affairs and international um, relations. And uh, I think this is, this is the, the best place to begin the, uh, the study of the Midwest. Of course, the uh, French end up occupying a lot of the center of the country or colonizing it, and the British end up over here. And the British, especially people in Virginia, start to get nervous about uh, French encroachments on their frontier. So they send 21-year-old George Washington out to the frontier to secure a fort uh, out by what would be Pittsburgh now. And uh, he doesn't have a very good trip. Uh, it didn't, doesn't end up very well. But the battles that he sparks on this uh, trip out to the frontier in what would be the back country then, the British back country, uh, and which would become the Midwest. But this battle he sparks and this war he sparks ultimately leads to the creation of the American Midwest. And uh, well, first of all, the United States and then the Midwest. As a couple of uh, historians joked, um, if George Washington is the father of his country, then here was the moment of conception when he went out to Pittsburgh on this ill-fated uh, errand. So the Midwest emerges out of this global war, the first global war, as Winston Churchill called it. And, uh, the, um, uh, and you have this fascinating story to begin your histories of the Midwest with. Uh, this is a couple images here, General Wolfe dying, uh, Benjamin West painting, General Wolfe dying in Quebec. Uh, this is sort of the key turning point when the British begin to prevail in this war against the French. So uh, long story short, the British win this war, and so they end up with this big chunk of territory in the middle of the country that will become the American Midwest. And it's not long before these American colonials, having experienced uh, a rebellion and having a lot more 
uh, fighting experience out on the frontier, they start their own rebellion. And George Rogers Clark, the American general, uh, smartly goes out to the American interior and starts capturing territory. And so when the Americans uh, sit down at the negotiating table at the end of the American Revolution, they can make specific claims to the interior of the country and uh, make claims to the future Midwest, which they get as a result of the negotiations. So the Americans end up with this chunk of territory out here where we are right here in Michigan, and uh, they begin organizing this territory, the Northwest Territory. And so this Midwestern uh, part of the country, which becomes the Midwest, was, uh, I think it's important to emphasize, the first American part of the United States, which Gleaves was talking about during his introduction. Because prior to this, many of these colonial areas uh, along the coast were, uh, they were, you know, colonies of Britain uh, first and foremost. But all these people who move into the interior, uh, not only are they uh, the first Americans to settle a piece of territory, they move in there with the ideals of the revolution in mind and, uh, the, and they know they can implement the Republican principles of the revolution. And they are guided by the founders of the United States who write the Northwest Ordinance and lay uh, and set forth all the rules for governing this chunk of territory, including things like the abolition of slavery, which gives a much different cast to this part of the country. And then we get the rest of it with the, the biggest real estate deal in world history. So who ends up out in this area? Well, in my class, I marched through the details of Reformation Europe and who's Protestant and who's Catholic and what kind of Protestant they are. And uh, because this is very important to explaining the development of the Midwest. And I go through all the details of the English Civil War and what parts of England are royalist and what parts are for parliament, et cetera. And this is why I do that. Uh, and this is very Colin Woodard-ish. This is, uh, you're gonna hear a lot more about this from Colin tonight, I think it is. But these different parts of England end up settling different parts of the early United States. Of course, the Yankee Puritans in New England, et cetera, and the Quakers uh, down in, uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, which have dramatically different cultures than the more aristocratic, royalist, slave-holding South. This matters because these are the kinds of people, the, uh, you know, the middle colony Quaker types and the uh, New England Puritans who have a major influence on who ends up in the Midwest, who founds a lot of the towns and societies uh, in this new Midwest, and uh, you can sort of follow the migration streams. So this is what helps make the Midwest so much different uh, from the South in the long run. So you begin to see the impacts of this, uh, for example, uh, in the years right prior to the Civil War. So this is a sort of neat silverish campaign map from 1856. Uh, this shows support for the brand new, newly created Midwestern Republican Party started in Ripon, Wisconsin in 1854, and it shows the results of the, you know, the anti-slavery uh, efforts of the Republican Party. So you can see, my point here is, you can see the regional differentiation beginning to emerge. Uh, there's different ways of looking at this. You can track uh, the different kinds of speech patterns and dialects as they move through the Midwest. Um, you can track this through types of housing and other forms of material culture, which I think Jim Davis is going to talk about here today. And then uh, you can map this uh, the way Colin Woodard does it in his great book, uh, American Nations, when he talks about the various uh, types of people, types of settlers, ethnic and religious cultural groups that end up dominating different parts of the country. But what, I mean, just take a look at this, for example. I mean, let's just take Ohio, the first state in the Midwest. 
look how varied it is. It's sort of southern on the southern tier. It's sort of a middle colony through the middle. And then, very, of course, very Yankee up here in the northeast, uh, the Western Reserve, where all the Connecticut Yankees moved and Cleveland area. So this, uh, okay, so you get this regional divergence. It begins to manifest itself in the 1850s and the 19th century, and you get uh, this cleavage between the sections, and it becomes most acute during the Kansas-Nebraska uh, debate. Who is going to control Kansas? Is it going to be the abolitionists? Is it going to be the slaveholders from Missouri? By the way, I'm working on an interview now with Marilyn Robinson, uh, the writer, and uh, her first book, Gilead, is just uh, completely uh, the undercurrent of the book is about you know, who gets to control Kansas. You know, there's this story about a small town in Iowa, but the backstory is about the settlement of Kansas. Uh, there's, here's an old map that uh, was done by the uh, Coast Survey showing uh, slaveholding patterns in the South. Uh, this is a map that they say was a favorite of Abraham Lincoln, the Midwesterner from Illinois, and he often used it to make his case for the distinctions between regions. You can see the map of the Underground Railroad. Uh, again, a very Midwestern, Northern institution. You can see uh, regional differentiations, uh, uh, the Civil War. These Midwestern states end up sending very large percentages of their fighting age men to go off to the war. In fact, all the Midwestern states have the highest levels of enlistment uh, during the war. Uh, you know, and I think, uh, I think Indiana was first and then maybe Iowa, then maybe Michigan, and so they were absolutely crucial to the outcome of the Civil War. Regional differentiation in terms of industrial development and rail development. Uh, this famous painting I've always liked, it's about the surrender of Lee uh, in 1865, which I think we just had the anniversary of a few weeks ago. And this famous painting uh, tries to draw out the regional distinctions between the sections. You have the sort of uh, common man from small town, Galena, Illinois, Grant in his muddy boots, not looking too fancy, uh, accepting the surrender of the regal aristocratic Robert E. Lee with his sashes and swords and polished boots. Well, this uh, regional differentiation continues. Uh, this is uh, an article, this is from an article the New Republic ran a few weeks ago or a few months ago, and uh, the author was making the point about the fact that um, uh, this idea that the United States is divided, this is nothing new. The idea of gridlock, this is nothing new. This has been going on a long time. This is the voting patterns from the 1880s, again, showing these sectional divides, of course, different parties at that time. Um, but I think that's a very important point to keep in mind. Um, okay, I'm gonna pick up the pace here a little bit. So these regional distinctions continue on, this is 1960, of course, the 1960s sort of scramble things around. But my friend Mike Pfeiffer has a new book out about lynching in uh, the United States, history of lynching. Here's a good, here's a good example of the uh, regional distinctions. 422 lynchings in Louisiana during this period of time. Well, there were 16 in Iowa. And if you go down into the data even further, most of those in Iowa were not racial, uh, racially charged uh, lynchings. They were someone stole a horse and got caught, so they were lynched. Here's an old map of Klan activity. This will give you a good idea of where the Klan was based and where it was not. You don't see many cla claverns in Iowa, for example. Segregated schools by statute. Again, a clear regional distinction. I was listening to NPR the other day, and uh, Toni Morrison was on, and she uh, went off on an aside about growing up in Lorain, Ohio. And she makes the point that when I grew up in Lorain, Ohio, it was a completely integrated school. Everybody went to the same place. 
blacks, whites, Eastern Europeans, this very polyglot group. And she said that, you know, Lorraine was a special place and it was much different from the South as her father often told her because her father grew up in Georgia and experienced some uh, very awful things. Uh, here's some, this will give you an idea of how the Midwest is an agricultural heartland. Uh, another point I want to make, so after you get these early streams of immigrants from different parts of England, then the Midwest gets even more diverse because you get this big overlay of immigrant groups from places like Norway and Germany. This is Herman the German in New Ulm, Minnesota, and this is uh, the big Viking in Alexandria, Minnesota, where people recognize these, uh, these kind of regional or these ethnic distinctions. Uh, all these uh, Lutherans and Norwegians in Minnesota, they kind of show up in this map. You can see all the Norwegians up in Minnesota and the Dakotas. That's the uh, Norwegian Lutheran heartland, um, which I'm sure John Butler is going to talk a lot more about this during his presentation. Uh, again, you can see uh, the distinctions by region. I'm married to a Norwegian Lutheran, so there's a little too much in here about the Lutherans. I'm sorry about that. Shouldn't have three Lutheran side slides in a row. Norwegians again. Okay, uh, homicide rates by region. Uh, again, pretty peaceful in places like Iowa and Minnesota, unlike um, you know some of these southern states where there's a lot more violence. Here's a Here's an example of the influence of the Germans in this part of the Midwest. I have a whole theory about how German immigrants sort of shape the Midwest, but I don't have time to go into that here. Um, German speakers, again, German influences. This is a great map that shows the influence of Germans in the Midwest because these counties represent, the red counties represent places where there are more bars than grocery stores. So that means you have a lot of beer drinking Germans. This is an even better map, which breaks it down in three ways. So you have all the beer people, Germans in the Midwest. You have the whiskey drinking backcountry Scotch Irish here down in Kentucky. And then of course you have the wine drinkers in blue here on the coast. Coasties like their wine. Bowling alleys, this is kind of the Laverne and Shirley belt. You can see the dominance of that in the Midwest. This was in the Washington Post a few weeks ago. There's so many fun things you can do with maps now that you couldn't before. Um, regional distinctions based on happiness. The happiest people are in the Dakotas, Nebraska, and Minnesota, according to Gallup. And the least are those on the west side, or on the right side. Another big 20th century story, black migration to the north, which I don't have time to go into. More recent decades, Hispanic and Muslim immigration. Quick note on, uh, on sports, which Professor McMahon is going to be talking about today. You can see the regional breakdowns based on who supports who. Um, of course, we're in Tigers country now. I see they're in first place, 15 and 7. Beat the twins last night, the hapless twins. But you can see the the various places that, uh, you know, the Twins are popular and the Tigers are popular. John Miller's Cardinals have a big swath down here in the southern Midwest. But what I thought was interesting about this is how Midwestern baseball was. This is where baseball players came from. Uh, look at these, uh, you know, Ohio sort of seems to be like a heartland of baseball players. Here's the football breakdown. Again, tends to be kind of a, in the old days at least, uh, you know, the Big Ten Midwest football was a big deal. Now, there's a very good story about this, how this transitions to be a more southern institution, which I'm sure Dave will talk about. I don't have time to go into it. I was going to make some weather observations. How are the agricultural heartland? This is the level of photosynthesis in this part of the country, which is a pretty amazing map. This is where, this is the Corn Belt, that high level of synthesis. There's a corn map soybeans, best farms in the country, you can see from that map. I'll skip my hot dish joke. Uh, the pop soda divide very comes out very clear in these surveys. Here's one I like. Country kitchens are dominant in the Midwest uh, and in the South, 
the Waffle House is the big uh, institution. And this is one that I really want Jim Leary to explain to us at this conference. Look at this belt through here. You've got, this is where all the country music singers in the United States come from, Tennessee and Texas, right? Why don't we have more country music singers in the Midwest? It seems odd. I mean, poor South Dakota. I don't know who this person is. There's apparently one person <laughs> out by Belle Fouche who's a country music singer who I don't know who that would be. But um, if you drive down the road, listen to the radio in the Midwest, and you listen to country music, they're all singing about Texas and Tennessee. Why aren't there more songs about Midwestern places? Jim Leary's going to answer that. Here's his famous book about uh, music in the Midwest, with, with, which has the best name of any book I'm aware of, Pokabilly. He can explain that. All right, I'll just finish here. Uh, well, when the Wall Street Journal uh, began um, writing about uh, Hillary running for president, which we all knew she would. I mean, this came out in 2014. Remember, the first thing she emphasized when she was talking about running for president, I'm a Midwesterner. I'm from Illinois. I'm a Cubs fan. So this will help me win Ohio and Iowa and swing states. And that's what she had in mind. So, and if you're looking, if you're looking for the most uh, region that swings the most politically, the Midwest is, uh, is where it's at. So this is where our political battles are going to be fought out because it's the most diverse uh, region and has so many different strains and strands of thought. You get, you get a sense of where I'm coming from. You, you understand uh, now a little bit better why I think the Midwest is a distinctive place and why it deserves to be studied more. Thank you very much.